Good morning, everybody. Oh, this meeting is being recorded, guys, too. Oh, so. damn. Okay. Damn. So better behave. Okay. Cruz. Okay. We better behave. We better behave. Yeah. yeah. But you have to give us all the chisme, which for those of you who don't speak Spanish, that's the gossip. That's well, the uh, intel. That's the 411. <laughs> um, so thanks, everybody, for joining us. This is part of a year-long uh, series that we're calling Pilot Projects which is really thinking about how ASU Art Museum can think about what museums will look like in the future and in the now. Uh, we were compelled to do things like this as a result of COVID-19, but it's really a long time coming. And as Kat said, one of the things I think museums need to do better is show, show the life of the artist and what is going on behind the scenes. We do a great job of presenting beautiful work in white spaces, but if, if my, the, the joy of my job uh, for over 20 years has been being inside the artist studio, understanding what they're doing and really being moved, moved and affected by that. And one of the artists that has most moved me and has uh, really someone who I, uh, I'm a longtime follower and huge supporter is Cruz Ortiz, who has done a project for us at the, at, the, at the ASU Art Museum. So we'll go into that in a little bit. But we're gonna um, start with a little bit of an icebreaker because I'm not gonna talk about your bio because that's boring. People can go online for that. So I wanna know like, who are you? Who is Cruz? Well, um, I- Ken I, I, <laughs> But also start with, who are you? And like, what are you drinking? What are you eating? Well, I, I you know, in Texas, it's noon, so uh, I'm already done with breakfast. Uh, we, we, my family, every Sunday, we go get barbacoa uh, from across the street, uh, which is, I, you know, it's like the head of a cattle, the head of a cow, and so you boil it down, cook it, and you, they serve it to you in a pan. That's what we had. We had big red barbacoa, Pico de gallo and corn tortillas, and now I'm drinking coffee. Gross. I'm a vegetarian, so that all sounds gross, but good for I'm you. I'm a vegetarian, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am drink well, I am drinking this amazing coffee. What? Yeah, I'm fancy like that. You muy fancy. Muy fancy. Oh, I have a t-shirt of yours that says muy fancy. I should have worn it. Um, but this is from my favorite store in Phoenix. It's called Shop for the People. And we've got, I'm going to do a little shout out to Sean there. Raise your hand, Sean. And, yeah, and Chad. Up. And they have a um, uh, cream coffee inside. And they're doing like the most amazing. And I like to drink it with my pug. Uh, oh, nacho. My pug's coffee. Nacho. No, Nacho's got his own like Instagram. This, this dog okay. is legit. But dog. my mom also made me my favorite breakfast is nopalitos yeah. with beans, right? Uh, that's spoiled. called chiflada. That's called chiflada. What does that mean in English? Uh, spoiled person. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, okay, so tell me, tell us, who are you? What are you? What's going on? I've been making work for a, a while. Like I, I keep freaking out that my my age keeps getting bigger and it's freak, freaks me out. But uh, for the most part, I've been making work uh, for over 25 years, probably. Um, and, you know, a lot of it, you know, I, I kind of hate to pin myself down onto one thing and or even style, even though I think I don't have a style, but then everyone's like, no, dude, you, you have a style. I'm like, oh, well, I, don't, I don't ever think about that. And I think um, when I think about my work long term, uh, there's different, you know, uh, themes that popped up. Uh, for the most part, it's just, you know, it's really just me, right? I'm putting myself out there uh, in my reality of where, where I'm from, where I've been, and uh, the exchanges that I have. And I think that's, you know, that's what a lot, you know, a lot of artists, you know, of course, that's what they do is, is that so sharing. Let me get into that. Let me get into that a little bit. Like, we, I'm looking at the chats too. Let's keep looking at the chats, you and I, so we can see what's going on there. But I'm gonna do like a little icebreaker because like, where are you from? That informs so many artists because okay. I happen to think that when you look at an artwork, it's just like one object, it's like a manifestation of everything you've ever 
seen, read, listened to, heard, gotten heartbroken from, everything. Like that one work of art is got so much in it. So little icebreaker for you. Um, tell us where you're from and then describe what work, like what work of art, like a song, movie, painting, dance, book, describes your childhood and where you're from. And for the rest of the group, everybody here, put in chat, you guys, let's, where are you all from? What painting, drawing, poem, whatever, perfectly kind of encapsulates where you're from? Throw it on chat and then we'll, we'll talk about it too, but uh, Cruz. So I'm, I'm from Houston, Texas. I was born in Houston, Texas uh, in 72. Um, it, it was it was a crazy time. I think uh, the 70s, if, if you can remember that, was just insane. I, I was definitely a corduroy bell-bottom uh, kid, you know, with the holes in them and running around making mud pies in my backyard. Um, and, you know, it's during those times that, you know, when I think about my work and what has influenced me, definitely Houston, I think. Um, I mean, because I remember spaceships going into space. <laughs> like, literally, they would take us out at, you know at the elementary school and like okay everyone let's go out nasa's launching another something or other and you know we're drinking twang tang and you know <laughs> and eating those cereals and so you know that totally influenced a lot of my work as far as uh the entire spaz tech series um which What's is that? Of, of paintings drawings video performance art that i did uh based on this uh this kind of charlie chapman character uh do you have any images in your studio? Show us. You know what? Do you want? I do. Got one right here. What? Where? He's right up there. You're frozen. So it's like this space character. Um, and um, it's pretty cool. I think, I think for him, you know, me uh, definitely having him uh, as a source, you know, has always connected to, you know, who I was, where I came from, the experience of being Chicano in the United States, you know, uh, that whole, you know, not part of a group, but then, you know, somehow sustaining the world uh, at the same time. So I think, you know, all those things have always mattered with the Spastic series was, was a, definitely one of the breaking uh, series that, you know, uh, that I started really produce work and you know now it's I mean obviously self-portraiture and so now it's turned into a whole nother animal so yeah so now I live Wait, in what's, the, what's the what's the work of art did you oh so that's no the that? work of art that describes you oh like, your childhood you know I don't I think it's the whole series I, I would say it's the whole spaz tech series definitely talks about you know who I was how I was raised um you know, I, I tell people all the time, like, and that's where I always had a hard time with the term Chicano, uh, where people would, you know, try to label me Chicano artist. I'm like, well, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't pick cotton. You know, I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, do all those things that the civil rights, you know, my parents and, or, you know, the people for them did. And I couldn't really, you know, I was raised on Scooby-Doo and the Smurfs and, you know, listening to George Strait, you know, and so my, my understanding of, you know, what it means to be a Chicano artist, uh, in that typical sense, I couldn't label it. You know, I couldn't, you know, peg hold well, that. Actual I thing. think I think the thing that when I first saw that Spaz Tech series way back, um, I just remembered thinking about how, you know, it's a metaphor, like, you know, like the, there's notions of alien and outer right. space and how I'm from Brownsville, Texas, and I relate to that too. I was raised on, you know, um, American too, but also had this other side, like nopalitos, you know, right. and, but that part wasn't really visible, you know, only the other part of me. So I always felt, I've always to this day still felt like there's always this other part of me that's hidden that I only choose to show once in a while. And when I saw that Spastec series, it, it really, like I really, res it resonated for me because I understood what it's like to be outside and inside and right be like an astronaut like of this world and outside and not and sort of negotiate space right and so like even with when i think about the performance art part of that 
you know, that was the real breaking the mold of what, you know, I was trained in school to be an artist and that, you know, no one was teaching performance art in the nineties. So like, I was just looking at some of my friends who were doing it, you know, there was some people that were doing it, uh, you know, in different scenes during the seventies, uh, that I was paying attention to. Uh, but I think it was really, you know, paying attention to how video, how performance art, how painting, drawing, all just became this conglomerate force of, of trying to portray that story, that story of alienation, the story of, you know, of adventure, of, of freedom, really. You know what I mean? The idea of going into space. Like, I still, people ask me, what do you want to do? Man, I want to go to fucking outer space. What are you talking, what are you telling me? Like, that'd be badass. Yeah. And so, like, that idea of just always being able to move, you know what I mean? That, that comfort with trans, you know, portation. So I it's think, though, comfort. The, the space thing, too, it's like being, I was also born in 1972, like all the cool people were. And um, the thing about it is that we were, <laughs> like, we did see the space shuttle challenger, you know, like we did that part of like NASA was definitely in our consciousness and it was culture. And I think that like, no, I too wasn't raised, like my grandparents were ra ranch hands, but I wasn't, my dad had a master's degree. I was like very middle class. Right. And, but that doesn't, but it, I think that the thing is that because there are so little portrayals of Chicanos and someone wanted to know what a Chicano is, it's a Mexican American who identifies with a certain political consciousness of right. being, uh, being uh, a person of Latin, Mexican American heritage and understanding that that Mexican American heritage isn't part of the, the narrative. Right. And us trying to insert our stories. But because there's so little stories of us that the middle class, Chicano from the 70s, you know, being inspired by NASA. Where do you see that? You don't see that in movies. You don't see that in, you know, essays and things like that. And I think that that's one of the one of the power of art is the idea of representation. And we'll talk a little bit about that with the mural that you did. But also, you know, and the, the idea that we can disrupt those narratives, those meta narratives. Art can do that. It can insert uh, lyrical, personal, biographical things that change the way people see and stereotype. Um, but I want to just throw it, change it a little bit, because I think that one of the things I'd like to, you to talk about with everybody is that being an artist, particularly middle-class, Mexican-American, Chicano, being an artist is, and I would say any artist, actually, it's right. very courageous. Right. It's very courageous to stake your claim and say, I'm not going to be a banker. I'm not going to do something that pays well. Like, I want to be an artist. How, like, what was that like for you? When was that, when was that turning point? And can you talk about, like, because I think a lot of people just assume that when they go into a museum that that artist, like, they just made that work. It just happened. And <laughs> art doesn't just happen. Yeah, it's, I know. You know, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, you know, I, I think about, People have asked me that before in a, in a very general sense about, you know, when did it all start? How did it happen? Kind of thing. I think I've always known, even as a kid, like I was, I, and I tell people all this time, but I, when I smell bleach, I think of my childhood because my mom would get pissed off at me because I would always draw on the walls with crayons, like huge dinosaurs and like all over the house, like the molding on the doors, like those classic 70s doors. I would fill in all the little pieces with crayon. And then my mom would like, cabron, put your cover, you know, get your ass over here. And, and there I am. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, that's always been a part of like that, that creative sense has always been a part of, you know, who I am. Now, you know, as that stuff develops, you know, I think it's definitely work. I, I tell this to people all the time. It's like, I'm constantly researching. I mean, a lot of my work is reading. Uh, I do a lot of writing, even more writing now. I think uh, the last two years I've been writing a lot. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the printing press and stuff that I, I'll show y'all later. But, um, but just the importance of, you know, understanding that, you know, being an artist includes so much more, you know, not just the creative part, but there's also the research part. And there's also the business part that I think that, a lot of folks, um, you know, I, I've learned from a lot of artists, you know, in reading their biographies and how they did stuff. And then 
you know, I kind of figured stuff out. And then of course, you know, I talked to other artists, how do they, you know, how do you handle your business? Like it's essentially a business too. So there's that whole animal that I think about. We'll, it we'll talk about that, but can you show us the printing press and then tell us a little bit about, you were a high school art teacher, right? Yeah, I was a high school art teacher. So show us the printing press. So I was uh, a high school teacher. Wait, I think you're a little bit more. I'll show you real quick, just a little quick. I'm gonna make everyone dizzy. This is actually the property. You're frozen. Cruz, you're, you're frozen. Can everybody else see? Kat, can you see him? He's frozen? Okay, hold on a second. Maybe he shouldn't move then. For, hey, Cruz, you're frozen, so go really slow. Okay, I'll go slow. Yeah, and when you move, just like go like this. Just go like this, okay. don't move. Oh my God, I'm not gonna move. <laughs> Sorry guys, hold on, let's try to get him back. Just texted him, hold on. Oh, it's a hot spot. D don't move, don't move anymore, You're, you get frozen. <laughs> I think it's the, the range of the Wi-Fi. Let me uh, do this. Just leave it. Just stay put. Gente is watching. I'm just going to do this. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just leave so it like over that. Over there is the print shop. So what we have over there are, um, there's three printing presses. There's a uh, 1920s Chandler and Price uh, Latin press, and then we have uh, two cylinder presses. Um, so they're all letter presses where we use lead type, wood type, uh, wood cuts, and then um, and then we just got some new monsters that are badass. I'm super excited about them, but um, they're able to really reproduce lots of uh, wood cuts, like like a hundred prints, you know, every three minutes or some shit. So it's pretty intense. So anyway, I love these things. So it's part of the practice. Printing. High school art teacher, how'd you become an artist? Well, uh, that was that was that was a crazy jump. I was really worried about it. You know, I think um, especially in San Antonio, you know, in Texas, uh, it's not New York, LA, or those you know hubs, epicenters for contemporary art. So it's hard to sustain yourself in that sense. So it was really difficult. You know, a lot of us have to teach. Um, and so, you know, and having a family, it was even more difficult, but I think it was definitely, uh, when I met my wife, Olivia, you know, at the same time, Absolute Vodka came to me and like, hey, we want to do this collaboration with you. You know, we've done it with Keith Haring and some other people. I'm like, what the? Yes, let's do it. So I think that was kind of cool. And that, you know, I think that big fact check was the one that convinced me, okay, you know what? I think I could do a couple of things. One, leave this teaching job because Teaching in Texas is the worst. Like, I think all Texas teachers need to just walk out completely and just, that's a whole other conversation. But anyway, um, so I left teaching uh, and we ended up uh, starting a graphic design firm, uh, me and my wife. And at the same time, that had helped me produce more work in the studio. And I think that was the, this, the biggest, you know, switch up for me in, in my practice in working uh, and creating a, and a solid work ethic to uh, really, you know, do the graphic design, but then also at the same time, um, creating uh, artwork in the studio, so. Yeah, I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about like that, especially with COVID right now and with artists, you know, I mean, New York and LA, they're just so expensive to live in. So artists more and more, and because of Zoom and things like this more and more, we do see a decentralization of the art world and you can live in Phoenix or San Antonio and 
Denver and, you know, and, and, and make a, a way for yourself and really be local and specific in ways that I don't think you could have in the 80s and 90s, where right. everybody like flocked to those centers. But <clears throat> before we get, and, and also, I, I mean, one of the things is that what you've done is you've created a sustainability so that, you know, you're not doing your studio practice, but you've got this other financial thing. And I, I, it, it's a struggle too. I know a lot of artists, the difference between fine art, art that's shown in museums and that has, you know, the only reason to make it is because you're compelled to versus graphic art where you have a client who's asking right. you to do something. That's a totally different process. But before that, I want the public to get to know a little bit, like you've got the paintings there. And, and I want to talk a little bit more about like the, the text work and the portraiture and the mission and like, what is it about you? Yes, I know that you were drawing when you were a kid and that you've got NASA, but like, what are you making? Like, what does your work say? So what now, say? Um, now, the, the, the actual conceptual developments have boiled down into a couple of, I think, solid uh, pathways for my work. Um, and that, the first one that I think is becoming more apparent is just the idea of documentation. Uh, I think, you know, seeing what I've seen, you know, working in the nonprofit world, working in politics, Texas politics, uh, working with people on the ground, you know, um, as an artist, I, you know, I have that ability and I love that, that I'm able to like hang out with big politicians, but at the same time be in the trenches, you know, protesting, you know, ICE, shelter, ICE detention center. So there's those things that I've noticed that what's even more important is the understanding of, of history you know, we, we've been here before. This isn't the first time, you know, a pandemic has been used to clear out my people. So, you know, as I research that has what has happened before, I'm finding gaps. There's huge gaps of not knowing what's going on. I mean, Texas, even the story of the Alamo, you know, is, is such a farce. It's, it's so made up and so very Hollywood that you know, there was an entire business community of Tejanos, Mexicanos, already situated in San Antonio. The Alamo was like on the outskirts of that little square. And it was a bunch of crazy gringos decided to take over that old mission. So, you know, those stories, that idea that, that you know, those aren't there and I'm not finding them. So as an artist, and also who's very interested in politics and interested in my people and the history of my people, I find it even more imperative to document today, it's now. Who are the people working right now? Who are the people making the difference uh, in other ways that we don't get to see in the news or the media? So it's almost like I have, I've created that sensibility of making sure that I'm doing my best to document the people, the stories, uh, and also providing access to that information, right? Because that's the other thing too. I can be documenting, but what if it just sits in my studio? You know what I mean? That does nothing. So well, I, yeah, that we, let's talk about the portraiture series. But I'm just I moved to um, before you got on. I was reading um, Gloria Anzaldúa and Cherie Moraga, and 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 you know a lot of the reasons I became a museum director as well is, and I think what drives a lot of the work, the curatorial projects I've done, not specifically Latinx, but is about insert it's about disrupting what we think we know it's about adding to it disrupting it and for my own reasons because i didn't have access to my own memories my own stories my cultures stories have been eradicated uh that i seek to introduce and contribute in a lot of ways the way you do i'm just going to read a quote from sheree moraga the really well known. Um, I think Tiffany Lopez is on here. She can add a little bit um, onto the chat of who Sheree is. She says, fundamentally, I started writing to save my life. Yes, my own life first. I see the same impulse in my students, the dark, the queer, the mixed blood, the violated, the violated, turning to the written page with a relentless passion, a drive to avenge their own silence, invisibility, and erasure as living, innately expressive human beings. And I feel like a lot of the work, Rafa's work, who's on here, your work, so many artists that we know um, are, are clinging. It's for their own lives, but it's also for students, for the next generation, which is why it was so important for me to get you into ASU Art Museum. 
to be able to influence and talk about how we can distribute and diffuse this kind of critical thinking, which is don't just think about the things you know. What are the hidden things? What are the, you know? And um, can you look at, can you talk to us about the portraiture and how you're doing the storytelling and maybe show us a couple? But don't move too much. Well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm sure y'all have been looking at those already, but uh, this painting right here is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, and I think she's on, Dr. Ele Ele Ellen Royojas Clark. Uh, she's an amazing uh, Chicana scholar here based in Texas. And um, it, it was so amazing to, uh, I, I've known her for years. Uh, in, she's a very political activist uh, here in Texas, uh, travels the world and just has always been an incredibly source of, of amazing inspiration as far as doing the work, right? And understanding what it means to be in academia, but at the same time, um, um, producing work that other people can share and, and use over and over. And I think uh, going, that's part of the series is that it's, you know, me getting these people and going to them. Like, so I took this huge 10 foot canvas to her house, her little, her casita. <laughs> and she, she's probably four feet, maybe like five feet or something, you know, and she and her hair is amazing. She's known for this, you know, amazing big hair. And, and she was like, I mijo, this thing is huge. Like she was just freaking out. Um, and so it was nice to, you know, and that's what I've been finding out in this, you know, very Western traditional method of, of portraiture. Uh, but for me, it's always, you know, the process, of course, you know, and I always think of my paintings as not the end game. And I think that's really important to understand that. Like, this is not the end game at all. This is just the starting point. Uh, and so I leave like in all the paintings, there, there's always something involved that tells a deeper story of what's going on in this painting. But what I tell people all the time is like, you know, when I'm there for two hours painting this person, I'm hearing their stories. Like, and there's this interaction as the artist and you know, me documenting her. And you know, at the time she was feeling ill so she was drinking tequila, because uh, that's what she does to heal, which is our great elder advice. Uh, so yeah, there's even a bottle of tequila there. Um, and so, you know, all these things that, that exchange was what was important to me. And I think documenting that was probably the, the most important part of this painting, of, of you know, getting those oral stories. We come from a people of oral stories. That's why we don't have a lot of history. It's the oral stories that, you know, get stopped. And I think that's that beautiful native tradition of just understanding how do we keep those things intact and to carry those on. So that's what this portraiture series has started. And so now I, you know, I'm painting politicians, I'm painting activists, uh, I'm painting uh, different activists from the Chicano community from the Native American community. Uh, so there's, it's been really neat. I've been painting uh, people who don't ever get recognized. So this is a painting of, um, this is a painting of Willie Velasquez. It's dug in deep back there. There's a stack of these paintings. Uh, so, and Willie Velasquez was a, um, he, he's the one who termed the uh, su voto su voz. Um, and he was uh, instrumental in, in, in... What does that mean in English for those that don't Both know? Both of your vote is your voice. And so he was the first one to really like get down. He was a doctor. He, you know, had already been, you know, being a professor at UT, I think, in, in St. Mary's. And so he com came up with a whole process of just, let's just get people to register to vote. He goes, like, he figured it out. It's almost like using, you know, the slave, owner, slave owner's tools on the plantation to take over this damn plantation. So I think that's what he did is like, you know, other people like him. And so those are, you know, those are the things that we need to document, those important stories, I think. And Willie Veloz is one of those um, who did that. You need to look him up. I'll put his name in here. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing is that you are, um, you're creating podcasts now right. with these stories. And this is, I mean, there's an active, there's an active part for you of, of, yes, they look beautiful in museum, but this is, this is really our record, the record that we, we don't have. I mean, I, when I look at your work, I, don't, I always think, like one of the things is you used to use a lot of text in your work. 
and well, a lot of Spanglish. And I don't know if you have any of those. Well, I, I'm going to show that I, you know, people don't really ever get to see this part of the painting, but down here, ah, let me see. Those are, those are books that Dr. Clark had some involvement with. And, um, I'll see about taking a picture of these and sending it to the group. But um, all these paintings, you know, uh, or all these texts on these uh, forums that look like books um, are super important. And I think, you know, those are the things that, you know, using text to further document, you know, the people and the stories of people, I think is so important. Um, and she was awesome because, you know, in talking to her while painting this painting, she was really like, I need you to put these books in there. Can you do that? I'm like, girl, I'm like Photoshop. We can add all. What do you want? You want a dog in there? We'll put it in there. Hey, well, like, well, I got one in the background there, and it's me and Nacho. So, <laughs> yeah. um, Cruz, you know, yeah, but it's, does, it's do, does Olivia or does anybody, can they bring to the thing, like, one of your T-shirts or one of the paintings? Uh, no, no, no. You know what? We would have to go to another section of the studio. Don't do it. Don't yeah, I'm not going to do that. But anyway, I mean, for all of you, we can look, we can share the screen too and take a look because it's 1036. I want to spend about next five minutes on the sh work at ASU Art Museum. Cool. But the thing about the text that I really love and that I was, I was sharing um, with, with you earlier is that oh. it's English. So like I have that t-shirt that says muy fancy. Oh, look uh, at him. Yeah. Okay, you got it. Yeah. You move, don't have the computer move. How about that? So here's a painting. What does it say? Sabes que? I think that amo mucho, mucho. What does that mean? And <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's funny because I'm from Texas and we speak a whole nother language of, of Spanish, English. We call it Tex-Mex. Some people call it Spanglish. But really, um, this is how I was raised talking. Like, and my parents talk to me, my uncles, they all talk, to, they'll repeat words that are like, like, oh yes, I, you know, or it's muy, 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 you know what I mean? Like there's different things that, you know, with language. And I think that's the other part that, you know, that's where the documenting, you know, documenting, documenting uh, came from as well. It's just documenting the, the, the style of talk, uh, not just the people, but, you know, and that's what the whole purpose of using text is like, understanding how we can take something and make it translate for a whole other group. But um, you know what's so important about that is that um, that Spanglish, you know, or like when, like, in, like we've talked about this in my culture, like you always go like, tengo hambre, I'm hungry. Like you just say both, I don't know, like, you know, and, and or you go like, I'm muy fancy, very fancy, but you're using both, you know, and you, we have all of these, and I'm sure anybody who's typing in the chat, add your, you know, add your like Spanglish-isms, you know, like my mom, you know, and Alejandro, like I always say, like my mom, you know, she used to say, Alejandro's mom was like, it's state of the arc. Like not state of the art, you know, just like amazing things that haven't been documented that are part of our experience. But what's important too is that I grew up in South Texas, and so many of us who's who are not part of the dominant culture, that was shameful. There was yep. intense shame in my parents' generation. If you spoke Spanish in school, you were sent home. You could oh, be yeah. expelled. I had to go D hall for doing that. Like, you know, yeah, you, you, you know, so this idea of that Spanglish, which is so core to our family, our culture, our way of life, it was a product of intense shame and secrecy. And for you to put that on a canvas and it's hanging in a museum for yep. any kid that walks through who hasn't done the actualization of what you and I have done, who don't have the parents that we had, whom they walk in and they see their language, their invisible, shameful language in a museum, that power is, that's why yeah. I do what I do. No, and, that, and that, that's documenting, again, the oral story part of what I was talking about. It's like, our people, that's how we, that's how we function. We talk, we, we commune, we, we share stories. And, you know, and I think that's the part that, you know, the new work or the work that I'm doing now is so much more um, uh, in a clear way articulating the need to document. Yeah, uh, let's, um, let's go the to the... Text the people. 
Do you want to share the screen of the work from ASU? Yeah, let me see. Okay. okay. Because I want to go for about five more minutes and then I want to open it up. All right, cool. Okay. I'm looking for stuff. So this not chat, by the way, is so good. It's insane, you guys. You know, <laughs> we're saying that, that Anshu is on here and she's saying this happens in her culture too, Hindi, English. Yes. And, you know, that's so... Well, you know, that's so funny because I think um, I was doing a lecture at Santa Barbara um, uh, UC over there and I, you know, I talked about that. I was like, wait a minute. And I could tell that there was people from everywhere. I was like, I know all of y'all have done this too. And like, whether it's Farsi, you know, English. And so then I had students come out and say like, okay, like, let's just say, you know, you're going to McDonald's, you're picking up something for your mom. Well, what would you tell her? And so then they would, they would text Mexican, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, okay. I, and I love that mixing part. And I think that's the thing that we don't get enough in the media in public is the idea that, yes, that's, that's a norm. That's a norm to mix, you know, and, and that's okay. That's exactly how we function. Yeah. Is well, to language mix. is organic, but let's get to the, let's get to the thing. I hate to be the like police, but I'm looking at the time. No, I can I, talk forever. Especially you and I could, like, let's just stay on. We'll stay on all afternoon. <laughs> for real. But you guys, for those of you who don't know, this is what happens. This is what curators and educators do is they go into places like this and we have these discussions and part of what I want to do at the ASU is how can we bring this into the space? If anybody has ideas, tell us, come talk to us. Because this, I think, is, is something that is missing in American museums and all museums today is what's going on here. Okay, share the screen. Watching out. I, on delay, on delay. I have so many damn pictures. It's like, it's, I'm like, what? Oh my God, never mind. Don't show that one. Uh oh. Yeah, I know. keep it, keep it G, keep it G. <laughs> anyway, yeah, and I think that, you know, when I did the uh, Arizona piece, that was really cool because I went out uh, to scope it out, right? And Where'd I, you go? Well, I went to Tano Forest, uh, the National Forest, and it was really cool because I was doing landscapes. Oh, here we go. Here, um, let me see if I can show this here. All right, can y'all see that? No. Oh, now, yes, yes. It's kind of weird. I don't know how it works. We got it, we got it, we can see it. Um, how do I move this? Okay. So this is the install, but this is a large uh, four panel woodcut. Um, and it was based on me uh, doing observations of the landscape. <coughs> I'm going out to, you know, in Arizona. Uh, these are the Camelback Mountains. Uh, up there in the top, and there's the moon, and then just the, the history of people crossing that border, I wanted, or those lands, I mean, that's the thing too, is like, you know, people for generations have been traveling through Phoenix, that corridor, uh, you know, native peoples have been, there was no border, <laughs> like, that's so funny to even think about a border, uh, but yeah, and so the, the, that, you know, that water jug represents, you know, people traveling through there. The, the, the snake, you know, as again, another storyteller figure in, in native uh, Chicano uh, understandings. Um, and then uh, you, could, you have the person who's in the river, uh, who's born in the river, who's of the river, um, and just always in love. He's looking up, he's dreaming. Um, and I think that's the other thing too, like when I think about my work, I think about not only the documentation, but then after I get that documents, right? After I get all that research, then there's this amazing thing that happens in the studio where that's my stimulus, right? To make other work. And I think that's the dreaming part. And that's, you know, this is a, an example of that, where I went into the field, I, I drew, I studied, I painted landscapes. <coughs> I studied the people, studied what was going on, my relationships, with them. and then I produced this piece. Where's the woodcuts? The 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 oh, there's Olivia. That's okay. a workshop at the ASU Art Museum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But do you have the pieces where you were in the studio cutting? Yeah. Let me see. I think you know what? I post on the Instagram. Let me see if I can. 
I think the other thing too, is you were telling me that you, uh, while you're doing this, I can just talk while you're getting it. Sound, yeah. sound good? That you were telling me that a lot of the thing that was inspired, you were, you were inspired by coming to Arizona and our landscape and that idea of, um, you, you know, our, our people have been crossing these lands for generations and generations and borders are just arbitrary. It's very difficult for us to comprehend. Animals yeah. cross these lands, species of all kinds cross these lands and they've been interconnected for, you know, thousands of years. Right. And uh, the other thing is that you were working with unaccompanied minors. You were, port so yeah. not only do you paint portraits of like, people like me, but you also paint, you were also working with unaccompanied, you were painting portraits of unaccompanied minors at the time in right. San Antonio. Can you tell us a little bit about that while you show us these? So um, that was also part of like the documentation project where I, um, there was a, at the time it was cheesy. I was already painting, uh, I guess, reflective paintings of, of the kids who were riding the, the trains. From Guatemala to the United States, and then I got to meet some of the kids um, from Ecuador, from uh, Nicaragua, uh, at this home that's here in San Antonio, and I, I was just drawn to their story. And I went over there to the the home, and you know it was really funny because I, you know I there was like probably forty of them there, and it was you know it wasn't a detention center. It was like there were like released and so they were just trying to figure out their lives and the center there the people there were trying to help them and so i'm like talking to them I'm like well let's just do a writing project because you know i'm a teacher and that's what i do so i was like you know in a quick you know kind of way can you draw a map of where you came where you started and where you were at the border or where you got picked up like i want to know that story <laughs> and all these kids are like and i was telling them like you know you know, in American history, we have a history of Americans who were enslaved would move from the South United States to the North. And a lot of them used the North Star. And they were like, okay, looking at me. And of course, I, know, I barely know Spanish. Like, I know text mix And it doesn't work if you're from Nicaragua to try to understand what I'm saying. And so they, I go, did any of y'all use the North Star? Like a dork, I said this. And they go, no, was, use Google Maps. <laughs> of course you use google maps what was i think and apparently like i looked this up uh on google maps they've been leaving pins from the guatemalan mexico border of where to cross so if you have google maps and you go to the border you're at the river it'll tell you don't go across here go over there and it's kind of cool how you know technology it's like, it's like quilts from the uh, underground railroad exactly. they would put quilts in the window and different quilt patterns said if it was safe or not right yeah. and so those are the things i think you know and so then i painted them you know i ended up painting them and i thought it was really cool to to document that kind of stuff you know yeah. as far as what that meant to you know to them uh so can you throw us, show us just a, uh, the images of it being done and installed? And then we have 10 more minutes. We have a little bit, more, a little bit of time. We can um, maybe go through the chat and see what people want to know. And maybe you, could you just like scroll images while we're doing this? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Okay. Oh, I think we already got people wanting to know. Uh -oh. They like you mucho a lot. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> mucho, mucho thank you. This is the, the whole woodcut. Uh, cut out before we inked it up. Uh, and by the way, this was all hand printed because I'm a crazy Mexican. But uh, we rolled it up with ink and then me and my two studio assistants, we hand barren the entire thing. So there, it's actually an addition of four. There's four prints of these. Uh, one of them, of course, is at ASU installed. Uh, but it, it's huge. Things and enormous. that's outside your house, right? Yeah, this is the studio parking lot. Um, yeah, we have four buildings. It's an old train station. It's kind of crazy. Um, are we going to see Olivia and the kids? Because that's what I see when I go to your studio. <laughs> I, don't, I think they're at the house watching videos or something. She's been watching, she, you know, she's so funny. She's like, uh, she, they've been showing uh, Jennifer Lopez. It's all about Jennifer Lopez. 
Interesting. And Olivia's like, you know, we didn't have this growing up. Like, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show them Jennifer Lopez. Go for it. That'll work. Okay, keep going. You you went off off. Um... Yeah. So I'm gonna show. Uh, la, 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 la. Oh, this is a cool one. Okay, so um, I'm throwing it to the group. Does anybody have any questions as Cruz uh, shows us some images? And oh, these, you tell us too. Well, um, you know, I'm really excited. I know Rafa's on, uh, super excited and everyone needs to jump on. Uh, we're doing this amazing intercontinental project um, called uh, In Plain Sight. And it has a lot to do with the work that, you know, we've all been working on uh, to shut down ice facilities. Um, so it's gonna be really exciting. Stay tuned, July, Fourth, uh, look up, look up into the skies of all the major cities, because uh, we're going to do a really cool project. It's going to be fun. Uh, you can follow it on Instagram. In plain sight uh, has a, a whole uh, feature on you know exactly what those details are and and who's involved as well. It's uh, Casils and Rafa are the the leads on these, so it's going to be really exciting to work on. Uh, Gloria Jenka wants to know how long did it take? Gloria Jenka. How long does it take to make this woodcut for us? La Reina de la Mesa is Santa Barbara. Yes. Uh, these, the big ones took about a week. Uh, this one took about two days. Um, yeah, I, that's the big roller. It's pretty fun. And then at our workshop, uh, what Kat and Andrea, our education per people did, is you can actually make banuelos, like the little um, handkerchiefs that you got there. And um, sure. you can take your kids, you can buy yourself, anybody. Like we have this interactive workshop where this is so that you're not just going to a museum and looking at art, you can actually go to our museum and make art uh, inspired by the work on view. And so you can make a handkerchief with all of these like uh, I, all of the symbols on the, on the woodcut. So when we're back, you can, you can come back and hang out with yep. us. That's us installing it. We, we paste it directly onto the wall, um, at the museum. It was super fun. And it went up really quick. It went up like in 30 minutes or something. Good. Which I, that's what I love about these these prints. I mean, they're they're they're. It's a great way. Like you know, I've done these a lot. You know, in in urban areas where I just you know do prints and we paste prints up. But to do this on this level was really cool. And to do a screen print, I mean, a woodcut print was really really cool. I think what's really important too is that <laughs> in the history of Chicano art in the '60s and '70s, and even if you think about you know um, like. Posada and Mexican art in the 1800s and 1900s, the most efficient and um, economic way to make art was printmaking and right. posters and, you know, and it was a way that was accessible and democratic. So that, that you're continuing this tradition is also really important because it kind of symbolizes that any of us, if we want to make art, we don't have to like get a canvas and do all this stuff like you can make art you can draw make you know yeah. carve do this it's available to you hey we have a really great question about uh the impact of the quarantine and what's going on and maybe you can throw us to a burnt nopal so um the quarantine's been fun i think you know you know i, I think it's what artists all want <laughs> is to is to you know is to have that chance for um you know to be in the studio without being the, the only thing is you know I, i've been loving it you know i you know it's horrible uh because you know we have to be really careful we have a special needs daughter so we're really like super strict here we spray down everything like literally and uv light everything um but um as far as the practice i think it's been really interesting i i can't get people to you know just i can't paint a lot of people anymore so We've been changing that up where we, uh, I invited a, a friend of ours to sit outside the studio. So we did like a social distancing portrait uh, session, which is really cool. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think it's, it's more about, you know, really honing the practice 
uh, the importance of documenting. I've been writing almost every other day um, about what's happening with my family because I want my kids to know, like, for generations after this, like, what was Cruz Ortiz doing during the pandemic? You know, we, we see a lot of that where people are researching, you know, Fitzgerald, you know, or, you know, what did, what, what did they do during the Spanish flu? So I think those kind of things are important to, to continue to, to write and to document. So. Can you, um, in our last five minutes, show us Burt Nepal? Yeah, let me show you the... So Burt Nepal is a uh, graphic design company. And um, it's, uh, I, you know, I'm, I can't say it's me because it's not. It's uh, my wife, Olivia. Uh, Who's amazing. Girl. She's my, I love her. Yeah, she's amazing. The, um, so we, we are essentially a design firm, but uh, over 75% of our clients uh, are nonprofits. So a lot of the, the clients that we work with are, are usually people who can't afford graphic design. Um, and we do our best to help them. And so because of that, we, we do a lot of uh, politicians. We work with a lot of politicians. Um, Show us the Julian. Do you have the Julian one? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was one of our, our cool um, clients was a presidential candidate, Julian Castro. He, who's a hometown boy, right? He's our hometown boy. Where is it? Show it. I think we have this. That's one of our, yeah, the Julian Castro. This was really fun. This is actually in LA <coughs> where we, uh, we helped really like come up with merch, come up with a, a brand for, for his look uh, for a campaign. And we, you know, we wanted to challenge what, you know, you've seen before, right? And so we wanted this bold, you know, font. You know, we used like the little, uh, the torch and the, for the accent, which was a big thing for him, you know, to making sure that people got that accent, right? Which is, you know, just continuing the history of, you know, of what Julian and the Castro family have done, you know, especially with his mom, uh, being so important in Chicano politics in South Texas. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know that, but her story is huge. Uh, she was one of the La, Vez, La Raza Unida party uh, candidates that ran in South Texas. You know, a lot of people don't know that, but South Texas had, you know, it didn't have the Green Party, but we did have a strong third party in a lot of the South Texas counties. Um, and so his mom was part of, a part of that whole effort to help switch around not looking at Democrats, not looking at Republicans, they're saying, no, we need our own party. So I thought that was amazing. Uh, he and, came and, you know, histories, again, histories we don't, yeah. our, our kids, you know, in elementary school, they don't have that history. No, 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 that's yeah. not, that's not going to be told. <laughs> Cruz, yeah. uh, people want to know the link to the podcast where you've been um, uh, okay. doing the story. So put that on there. And then also um, part, I think of the, Bert Nopal, what I think is really amazing too, is that uh, the specificity of the text and the type and the la language, it, you know, again, when you're um, looking at like modernism or looking at this like really tight, clean type all the time, it doesn't feel, you, you know, and we can say in museums all the time, like it's free, you're free, where it's accessible, come. But then we don't understand why nobody shows up. And it's because we don't actually take the time to think about signs and symbols. Right. And I think that's where graphic design can really be helpful. And I think that's one of the reasons Absolute Vodka and Lone Star and all of these actual companies are turning to you because they know who their market is. Right. They know. I mean, the thing is that, you know why I, do companies know, but us <laughs> museums, we're supposed to be doing such a good job and so democratic, and we're still right. like, you know, Times New Roman, blah, blah, blah. But like companies get it. They know that we are a huge percentage of the population. Right. Well, it, you know, the, the growing Latino market, you know, and that's one of the things like a lot of our, you know, critics, and we've had lots of them, we're like, well, dude, you're a sellout. I'm like, well, let's hold up. <laughs> you know, I, I, Understanding narratives that have been told before, why can't I help change that narrative? Messaging, right? So if I'm going to be doing graphic design, or if I, if I have an issue with, oh, well, you know, that's bad representation of my people. Well, you know what? 
those companies have a responsibility to come to people like us to help them make sure they get to get it done right. And so I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of more of that. Adidas, uh, you know, we've worked with a lot of, you know, Red Bull, a lot of those big corporate conglomerates are really understanding the power of good, right? And one of our, our big uh, gurus that we follow is uh, Abdel Aziz, uh, who has this book with Bobby Jones called uh, Good is the New Cool. And There's a podcast that. too. Yeah. And he is, um, they are just so amazing. They highlight a bunch of, you know, you know, companies like Patagonia who are suing Trump. You know, those things, those are the things, uh, is the new cool. Um, those are the things that, you know, we need to see more of. And I think, you know, if we're going to be in this kind of society where, you know, we're seeing things not turn out to be so well, then let's be part of the solution, not just bitching all the time. So I think that's what Bernal Paul is about. It's, it's about providing, you know, access to uh, those kind of being that link and making sure like Lone Star, Paps Brewing came to us specifically saying, you know, we see the change in demographic in, in Texas. We, we see it. We, we want to we wanna do it the right way. We don't want to seem like we're pandering. How do we do that? I'm like, well, you got to be coachable first. That's what we always tell. I mean, I've seen Olivia... <laughs> you know, yelling at people at Papa John's. Are you coachable? If you're coachable, we can work with you. Because now we vet. We vet through all these clients. And we've had numerous, you know, corporations come to us and we we're like, mm, no, we're not going to work with you. So um, it's been kind of interesting to see that happen. And that's a whole, that's a whole nother podcast as far as, you know, what it means to be an artist, what it means to be a graphic designer, and then also, you know, switching around those, those games. So. Well, I want to close it up. I haven't eaten my tortillas. My nopales are getting cold. Mm -hmm. Got to go get some more cream coffee. Meet you guys in Phoenix at For the People. Um, I'm eating, actually eating from this amazing uh, uh, plate that says complete fucking insanity that I got at this amazing store called Practical Art here in town. <laughs> but I want to, I just want to thank everybody for participating in this amazing talk. Cruz, yes. you're my, my primo. I love you. I love your family. Um, you inspire me. You make me, you know, I mean, I think that sometimes when shit is going wrong, you know, I think we're fighting the good fight. I can go to bed and know that we're, you know, what we do every day is contributing. And so I want to thank you. And I want to thank everybody for being on this, like being our guinea pigs. Yes. Um, I hope to see you guys. We're going to be doing a lot more Zoom, a lot more, uh, pilot projects. And the thing about us is that ASU Art Museum is coachable. And tell us, give us <laughs> that. What do you want to see? What would you like to do? Let's do this together. Let's co-create and co-reinvent what museums can be. Um, so love you. Love you all. And hasta luego. All right, cool. I'm, and should I, can I still answer questions on this? Because I feel like... Yeah, anybody who needs to go, go. I'm hanging for a little while and we could just, you just take the chats and answer questions. Be like Oprah. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, I'm going to stop. How do I do this? Well, I guess I got to. Okay, start answering questions. Somebody wants to know about whether you moved to Houston. Did he leave? <laughs> Did he leave? Let's see if he, Cat. He's trying to see how, yeah. he went to Zoom, but he's trying to figure out how to answer. Okay. It's a very good, very, very good approach. I'm, I'm really delighted in the, in the conversation. Uh, fascinating. Uh, my point about us being viewers of art is that we bring our own perspectives our own experiences, our own abilities, and in general, quien somos, you know, that we can really read Cruz Ortiz's work so well because we understand his use of symbols, his text, his icons, and of course, all the themes that he portrays. So thank you for making it visible to everybody. Thank you, Ellen. Hope to see you at the next one. 
Um, anybody else? I'm going to hold down the fort while Cruz maybe comes back. I don't know. Where did he go? He's just trying to chat. I think he went off, though. So that does cut it off. Yeah. Well, maybe I think we're just going to end it since mm -hmm. I don't see him coming back. Um, and thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.